an algebra researcher um, rather than random matrix theory. Um, I only essentially use results in random matrix theory. Um, I have the utmost uh, respect for those who actually work in the field. Um, <clears throat> And this is joint work with uh, Joel Trop uh, at Caltech, and it's based on uh, a recent archive preprint that we posted last year. Um, right. So uh, there's a significant overlap here with uh, what uh, Joanna told us about on, on Monday, I think. Um, but uh, let me just I'll say a little bit um, from my viewpoint. Um, hopefully, it will not be completely um, the same. Um, so uh, in my viewpoint, uh, algorithms and numerical linear algebra we basically are a field that solves uh, two types of problems, uh, linear systems or eigenvalue problems. So it's kind of a boring field, you might think. But of course, it's you know what happens inside is exciting. And um, in my mind, there are three types of, of methods that um, people have proposed, uh, very broadly speaking. And the first one is the so-called classical methods or classical algorithms where basically we are targeting a uh, matrix that um, we don't assume any structure. So it's a dense matrix. Uh, <clears throat> and we are pre prepared to use uh, n cubed operations for n by n problem. Um, so if the matrix is, is in the thousands or something or smaller, these methods are incredible. Uh, they work um, amazingly reliably. Uh, they're guaranteed to be backward stable, essentially. Um, and this is very much the workhorse algorithm. Um, that is used everywhere to solve um, small to medium uh, scale problems. <clears throat> now, there are problems that are too big for classical methods. So uh, in the 1960s and, and beyond, uh, people have looked at um, so-called iterative methods. And then uh, Krilov subspace methods are among the most uh, prominent <clears throat> class among iterative methods. They're not the only class, but um, that's a, the class that we're going to actually talk more about in this talk. Um, and the, the advantages of iterative methods that is that when the matrix is in a favorable situation, um, the problem can be solved much, much quicker than uh, classical uh, alternatives. So for example, you might be able to solve the linear system in, in squared operations uh, if, for example, the matrix is uh, sparse or uh, maybe the, the eigenvalues are clustered away from the origin and then you work to use CMRS. Um, but uh, otherwise, for example, if there's no structure in the matrix that you can easily take advantage of, uh, it's not going to work. It still requires n cubed operations with probably a larger constant, and it's not as stable or reliable. Um, and usually, we need we're really looking for a preconditioner or something like that in order to make uh, iterative methods work well. Now, um, the focus of this talk is uh, the third class, class of algorithms called uh, randomized algorithms. And, and you know, there have been many excellent talks and um, excellent papers that have been written on the subject that I probably don't need to say too much about this, especially to this audience. Uh, but I have my own slides um, that I would like to use a little bit to, to highlight why we would like to randomize. Once again, you want to give a great talk <clears throat> to summarize this. So I won't I completely try to repeat her. Um, but some of the ideas in randomized linear algebra, at least to me, is um, to uh, so, so I, I classify into four categories, even though this is probably not um, mutually exclusive or, or exhaustive even. Um, but one idea is to say, instead of looking for, like in, in the classical numerical linear alg algorithm, uh, you're looking for a backward stable solution with essentially numerical machine precision accuracy. If you're willing to tolerate, like, say, um, a suboptimality factor of um, like factor five or something, then sometimes you can um, say you can get that solution with a much, much faster efficiency um, with high probability, usually. And so a success story along these lines um, is probably uh, the most prominent is the, the Helco Martinson Trop um, randomized SVD algorithm, which um, I'm sure turned up um, a few times in this uh, workshop. And um, another class, which is completely different to me, is, is based on Monte Carlo style sampling. So uh, the, the most classical version of this, I think, is the matrix multiplication by Jernias, Kanan, and Mahoney, which I think is one of the, um, well, the very first papers in the subject that kind of um, started out this um, field. But uh, they basically show that you can do matrix multiplication. Um, 
combine that with Monte Carlo style sampling to get, um, well, it's not necessarily very accurate, but at least fast approximation to the matrix multiplication. Another very successful line of work is uh, when you want to estimate the trace, um, this is essentially the only way to, to do it right in some sense. Um, so you can estimate the trace of uh, a large matrix whose entries are not explicitly given by essentially taking X transpose AX, uh, where X is um, usually a rata marker, a plus or minus one random vector, and then you average. Um, the third type that I'd like to actually focus on in this talk is, is sketching, and this was very much on Cora's um, talk, so um, uh, I think it's a nice uh, transition, but I'm going to use it for uh, linear algebra problems rather than uh, optimization problems here. And um, uh, blend and pick has uh, been uh, mentioned by Cora, I think it's one of the big X of Avron, uh, this paper is blend and pick, but there have been other uh, precursors and also extensions and um, beyond um, that solve least squares problem, usually a very tall skinny least squares problem, um, and you're going to be sketching that to reduce the dimension um, to get an approximate solution or sometimes a machine precision solution if you're using it um, as a preconditioner. Um, another very compelling line of work, which um, is not directly related to this talk, um, but still very interesting, is um, to, to use randomization, randomized, randomized perturbation sometimes to um, avoid pathological situations um, with high probability. So um, classical methods will try to basically deal with any pathological or bad situation um, it has to do so because we're, we're trying to, to get an algorithm that works all the time. But um, those cases are sometimes very, very vanishingly uh, rare. So that having to deal with that is a little bit like um, overkill. I um, mean, that can be uh, basically gotten rid of by just doing some randomization so that uh, this bad case will happen only with really uh, small probability instead of you know, assuming the problem can get come anywhere, in that case, we might have to still deal, deal with the pathological cases because maybe the problem wasn't such a difficult one. Um, so uh, there was a paper uh, that talked by Banks yesterday, which was amazing. Um, there have been other works um, in this direction also. Um, OK, so um, my focus here, once again, is, is sketching. Um, and Essentially, like Cora just told us about, um, the idea is to start with a big matrix, reduce the size by uh, randomized sketching. So uh, in my notation, S is always the sketching matrix. So think of this as, um, well, the theoretically, um, S can be always um, be taken to be the Gaussian matrix. Um, but in, in practice, uh, we should be taking it to be more structured, um, hashing um, or subsampling together with some um, FFD a sub matrix, for example, is a very good way of um, choosing the uh, sketch matrix S. So um, the idea is if A had some sort of structure or like low rank property and so on, um, S times A might contain enough information to, to solve the original problem, at least approximately. Um, and this idea has been enormously successful in low rank approximation. Um, most of all, I guess, um, and also least squares problems, which is um, going to be something that is going to be key in what follows um, and other problems that um, I randomly mentioned here. Um, but an important observation um, um, after all this is uh, for the, the most prominent or most standard problems that we solve in numerical linear algebra, uh, namely eigenvalue problems and uh, linear systems involving square matrices. And you know, we're not assuming anything like a low rankness or anything here. Um, you know, linear systems, essentially we, we can't solve low rank linear systems, right? So if the matrix A is non-singular um, and not low rank, then how do you solve a linear system uh, using a randomization? Uh, is that even possible? Um, there have been a small number of success stories. For example, if the matrix A is a Laplacian matrix, um, uh, you might have heard of uh, papers by King and, and uh, co-authors, um, but uh, we're not gonna see that kind of structure in the matrix. Uh, if A is um, essentially a generic matrix, usually sparse or something, so that matrix vector multiplication, uh, it, it can be done much quicker than N squared. 
um, as will be the case uh, with the dense matrix. But that's essentially the only assumption. Um, and that, that is very much the assumption that we usually make uh, in order to solve large scale problems. Um, so when we, when we talk about large matrices, we're usually thinking of a sparse or at least some kind of um, structure in it so that we can at least store the matrix. Um, anyway, so the, the highlight of this talk is to, did somebody speak? Okay, um, feel free to stop me if there's any questions or on clarity. Um, the, high, uh, the key point of this talk is to use uh, randomization for solving um, these uh, core problems in numerical linear algebra. And it, it turns out that um, what we do essentially is to use a sketching um, for a problem that arises naturally in GMRS and Rader Ritz. So GMRS is a lin uh, linear system solver. Rader Ritz is essentially an eigenvalue solver. Right. Um, so um, uh, before I get on to my, um, the algorithms that we propose, um, I would like to highlight um, a little bit of a repetition from uh, Cora's talk. Um, how does sketching work for least squares problems? And essentially we're thinking of a least squares problems that is very, very um, overdetermined. So it's a very tall skinny matrix. And then we're trying to fit A times X um, to, to fit um, the uh, given vector B as much as possible. And the idea is simply sketch. So we have a tall skinny matrix and a vector. We sketch so that we uh, reduce the aspect ratio. So imagine like um, you had a, a million by a hundred uh, matrix here, uh, you're reducing it to like 200 by 100. So the aspect ratio goes from like a um, thousand to two or something. So um, this matrix still needs to be rectangular and tall but it's, it's a lot, lot closer to square. Um, if, if, if we do so, and if, for example, S is uh, a Gaussian matrix, um, it doesn't have to be Gaussian, but for, for theoretical purposes, it's the nicest matrix to, to think about, then um, you can, um, using Marchenko Pasteur, which uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of, or even know much better than I do, um, you can immediately conclude that for any vector uh, V that you multiply, um, uh, the, the two norm vector of essentially uh, the residual in terms of the um, sketched problem is um, up to uh, a small constant um, between one. So uh, we do need to, to, to um, scale the Gaussian matrix by one over square root of um, uh, R or S, I guess, in this case, to, to make it make sure that the expected value is, is the same as the original uh, uh, norm of the vector. Um, but once you do that, um, so basically the crux of the matter is um, this vector has a uh, residual, which is within um, like a factor two of the, the exact residual that we are looking for. So this is like the original problem. This is the sketch problem. Because it's a small scale problem, it's a lot easier to solve this. But the point is, if you solve this problem, um, you're also minimizing the, the original objective function value um, up to a uh, say constant two. So um, it immediately follows by, that by solving the sketch problem, you are, uh, you're reducing or minimizing the, the original problem um, to up to a factor of one plus uh, epsilon over one minus epsilon. Epsilon here is not like super small. It's like one half or something. Um, but uh, so this is great news, especially if the right hand side is small in the sense that, which means that the original problem is nearly consistent. Um, so if the original ha problem had residual uh, 10 to minus 10, for example, with the optimal solution, then this means that your sketched problem will give you a solution which has a residual like two times 10 to minus 10, which is still a great solution, right? Um, usually in terms of fit at least, it, it's, it's very nice. And you can also use perturbation analysis if you need, if you need to, um, to talk about the solution accuracy itself, um, x minus x hat. And then that would be nice also if the condition number of A is, is um, small. Um, uh, like I said, um, it's nicest to do Gaussian sketch um, for the theory. Uh, in practice, you can do all sorts of other sketches which are more efficient, like um, subsampled randomized Fourier transform. Past version, which is uh, which is actually incredibly nice, especially when um, um, this doesn't work, uh, work by uh, Cora and uh, co-authors. Um, there's, there's also uh, sparse sketches that um, people have looked into, which also work, at least in theory, very well. 
Um, right. So I, I like to, um, to to add the slide um, to everybody, but for this audience, it's probably not necessary. But um, yesterday we had a talk by um, Arno. Uh, Lars, um, and he had a list of like five important results in random matrix theory. I wasn't actually sure um, if Marchenko Pasteur was included. Um, I had the urge to mention it, but I know I was um, I was too shy to do so. <laughs> but um, definitely to me, Marchenko Pasteur is high up there in terms of how important it is in, in computational mathematics as a result in random matrix theory. So um, in, in layman terms, <laughs> um, what it tells me is um, if you have a rectangular random matrix, so a random matrix that is rectangular, um, you know, for, for the purpose of simplicity, I'll assume the matrix is uh, Gaussian, but it doesn't have to be um, as long as IID and um, finite variance uh, mean zero, it works. Um, um, the, the singular values of um, a random rectangular matrix, which is M by N, are captured in this uh, small interval, square root of m plus or minus square root of n. So if your aspect ratio of the matrix is something like two by one or three by one, it doesn't have to be like a hundred by one, um, but it does have to be like um, rectangular and it, it shouldn't be like only one larger or something like that. Um, so if m is like a proportionally larger than n, then this is a ni very nice support. Um, so what it tells me is all the singular values are captured in this very small and in tiny interval. And therefore the condition number, which is the ratio of the largest over smallest singular value has to be uh, small. And then this happens with essentially um, enormous probability. Um, so uh, any tail singular values lying outside decays, uh, the probability decays exponentially. So we have high uh, confidence that all the singular values lie here. And how is that uh, useful here? Um, it's useful because we can use um, Marchenko Pasteur to talk about um, the norm of this uh, residual vector um, for any vector v in, in the following way. So basically what, what we can do is we can look at the, the subspace spanned by the two uh, matrix and vector put together A and B. But let's take the QR factorization. It, when you sketch uh, this linear least squares problem from the left, uh, we will be talking about um, basically S times A and S times B. Um, in terms of this matrix, we'll be getting, uh, we can think of, think about this S times Q matrix, um, which spans the uh, new subspace. Um, but the point is, if S is, for example, Gaussian, then SQ is also Gaussian. But this, the size of this matrix is, uh, for example, because of the way we are sketching, it's like Q, QN by N. So it's rectangular. And uh, so that would correspond to the case where m equals two times n. So once again, uh, we're in a situation where something like this, I guess, um, so the, the second picture, which is still beautifully well-conditioned, um, this matrix is well-conditioned. So um, what used to be this uh, vector um, after sketching becomes essentially this vector. Um, this used to be orthonormal. This is no longer orthonormal, but this is super well-conditioned. So um, in terms of how they relate to each other, um, once you scale S so that, so that the norm is essentially order one, um, they're equal up to a constant, say, um, which is governed by the condition number um, of, of this interval. And that's like three or something. And that is very much exactly why um, we're able to get um, a good residual solution um, after sketching the least squares problem. I hope this makes sense, but I don't know. Um, and I will still like to highlight, even if that didn't, um, how important Marchenko Pasteur is to me, uh, at least. Um, so it, it, uh, it penetrates many other related concepts um, in con uh, computational mathematics, including, for example, um, the res restricted isometry property in compressed sensing, and so on and so forth. Um, right. OK. So. Uh, maybe before I move on to the core algorithm, um, so all this was talking about uh, reducing the dimension of a very tall skinny least squares problem. So one might argue that, well, okay, that's very nice, but it sounds rather artificial, right? When do you actually have a very tall skinny least squares problem? Um, when that ha happens, you could argue that, did you just sample too many you know, data points and so on? Maybe you can, could have just you know, sampled less and you know, got away with it, which is a good point. Um, but I'll try to argue that um, um, 
such a situation actually arises very naturally in the context of um, solving a um, linear system with the, for a square uh, matrix using GMRS. So this is where um, I get to the meat of the, the algorithm. Um, so <laughs> um, GMRS, um, it, which is a standard method for solving a uh, sparse large scale linear system, it is based on uh, the idea of finding um, uh, the best solution that minimizes the residual in a subspace. And the subspace is the so-called uh, Krulov subspace uh, based on um, essentially a polynomial of A times the initial vector B, or usually the right-hand side vector B. Um, and there are all sorts of ways to explain why this is a good idea. I'm not gonna get into it um, too much, but um, if A has like favorable spectrum and like eigenvalues uh, clustered away from the origin, then you, one can show that um, this method converges exponentially um, to the solution um, in terms of K. Um, so in terms of the practical implementation, uh, you could think of like forming this matrix and taking the QR factorization and then finding the solution there. Uh, that's a bad idea because this um, this subspace tends very much um, to the dominant eigenvector of um, the matrix A. So we don't want to do it. Um, in practice, what we do is we do the so-called Arnoldi orthogonalization. So we times the matrix um, to a vector and then orthogonalize against the previous vectors um, and form the so-called Arnoldi decomposition. Um, so I wasn't sure if, um, if this is all common knowledge to everybody, um, but maybe it is, in which case I'm sorry. So um, Arnoldi, what it does is it will form an orthonormal basis by this so-called stitch, still just orthogonalization. So times by the matrix and orthogonalize against all the previous vectors. Um, the outcome is this decomposition, uh, which um, has um, the orthonormal uh, vectors, um, the same matrix with an additional final vector. And then this is a Hessenberg matrix, with, which is almost a tri triangular, but also has a one subdiagonal entries. Anyway, so um, once you run this Arnoldi uh, process, uh, GMS, what it does is it will uh, start with the governing equation, which is to minimize the residual in the query of subspace. Uh, that can be re rewritten as uh, this in terms of minimizing the y, uh, or minimizing the residual with respect to y. Um, and that can be written equivalently and very conveniently as um, eventually uh, a least squares problem involving uh, uh, upper Hessenberg matrix. So this is a um, k plus one by k upper Hessenberg matrix, which is very nice to solve. At this point, we can solve it in just k squared work. And k is the number of iterations. So it's, it's always much smaller than n. So this part is actually negligible completely um, in terms of the, the, the execution. Uh, what is the um, um, overall complexity of um, GMS? It, it basically consists of the multiplication, um, matrix vector, vector multiplication. And, um, so A times a vector. You have to do this k times um, to do k iterations of GMS. In addition, we have to do um, the Arnoldi orthogonalization, and this can easily be the bottleneck. So this costs you order n k squared, and this is exactly where we're trying to we're going to try to reduce the cost because um, a can be, for example, very sparse. In which case, this can be something like um, order n k. Um, so n k squared uh, once k becomes into um, in the order of like hundreds or thousands, this can be really the bottleneck. Um, so let's try and reduce this is where we started, um, well, the discussion essentially. Um, and the first idea is to look at um, the first equation that pops out in the GMS equation. Um, and we can obviously sketch this, um, but the question is, is there any point? And then the answer is not really, <laughs> because, um, because we already done our only decomposition. We know that AQ is equal to QH and then therefore by, um, you know, orthogonal transformation, we can reduce it to a Hessenberg least for his problem. At this point, there's really no point in sketching. Um, and then you can sketch this, but that's kind of like a waste because we already have a, a nicer representation of the problem. Um, so you might feel like we're stuck, um, but then we can go back and say, um, well, actually, we don't really need the Arnoldi decomposition to, to do all this. Um, and namely, we don't need an orthonormal basis for the Krylov subspace. Um, and this is where all the heavy lifting went um, in the Arnoldi decomposition. So instead, why don't we require only that we have um, 
I ortho, I'm sorry, a, a basis, which is not orthonormal, let's call that B or BK. Um, but we do require that the span of BK is the same as the span of basically the, the, the creole subspace. Um, but if we're able to find BK, which is um, the same span, but quicker, um, then we can talk about uh, the same GMS problem in the sense that um, B times K is going to be exactly equal to Q times K um, because they span the same subspace. Um, then we can talk about sketching this. So the, the crux is BK might be able to be computed quicker, um, and then we can sketch that problem. We can now sketch, uh, solve this sketched problem to get um, approximation to a GMS solution. So obviously this is um, a problem which is naturally uh, very tall skinny because we never run GMS to like n steps. We usually run it to like um, hundreds or maybe a thousand steps at most um, for solving a like million by a million problem. So this is like a million by a thousand very naturally. Um, it's right for sketching. We will sketch it and we will solve that. Um, so it, does all this make sense? Uh, so namely, is it actually feasible to find an basis matrix BK, which is not orthonormal, um, but much quicker than NK squared cost. And um, so the observation we should make here is um, BK, there's a lot of room for uh, flexibility here. Um, we used to require that it, it is orthonormal when we do Arnoldi. We don't need that. We, not, we don't even need it to be a low condition. Um, all we need essentially is that it is a numerically full rank. Um, so the condition number uh, uh, BK is like 10 to the 15 or something, um, it is fine. And this really gives us a lot of room to explore alternative methods for uh, forming BK, which is a basis for the Kirill subspace. Um, it is still a bad, bad idea, we, we, we did try this, <laughs> to form the Kirill matrix um, and following the definition because this grows exponentially usually as you uh, do more Kirill iterations. But um, one thing that seems to work pretty well, um, and this is the method that we um, kind of advertise, um, is truncated orthogonalization. So um, instead of orthogonalizing the new vector against all the vectors uh, that we have computed previously, we only orthogonalize it against, um, say, like the past two vectors, past four vectors, maybe past 10 vectors. But this um, p uh, parameter p, which is the number of um, or vectors that we orthogonalize against um, is fixed as a constant. So um, every time we orthogonalize, the cost is not um, order n k after k iterations, more like order n. So therefore, the, the overall orthogonalization cost becomes order n k rather than n k squared. Um, and n k essentially is like a lower bound for the complexity of running GMS because every matrix vector multiply will usually at least take order n um, complexity, right? Um, so I do want to highlight that this is only a hack and it's not guaranteed to work. In fact, there are cases where it does not work, um, but it turns out to work better than we thought. So um, for the moment, this is the best we have uh, in our toolkit. Um, there are even better alternatives when it works um, based on, for example, Chebyshev recurrence. So this actually doesn't even need to be orthogonalize anything. Um, if you know that the eigenvalues lie in a certain interval, and then if the eigenvalues happen to lie, um, will be distributed more or less um, uh, uniformly, then um, Chebyshev recurrence is another great way of forming um, the basis. Anyway, so um, here's a highlight or comparison amongst um, the, the methods. Um, so standard GMS is going to be dominated eventually uh, by these, uh, this nk squared cost for k iterations. Uh, we reduce that to essentially order nk, a p is a constant um, by uh, sketched GMS. So sGMS is sketched GMS with a uh, truncated ortho orthogonalization parameter p. Um, it does need to sketch and solve, but that's almost never going to be the dominant part of the complexity. Right. Um, so here's one of the highlights in terms of the, the results. Um, we're solving a non symmetrical linear system here. Um, using GMS and also uh, sketch GMS. Uh, also, um, we're comparing also uh, the restarted versions where, uh, so restarting is the classical remedy for reducing the orthogonalization cost 
Um, so after like 10 or 100 iterations of JMS, you, you basically say, um, we throw away all the previous iterations, we start anew um, with the current solution. So this will lose the optimality of the, the curl of subspace, but at least it will have, um, um, it will not like keep growing in terms of the cost as you run more GM reservations. So what we see here is um, essentially as predicted by the fact that we're just solving a sketched problem. So it should not be worse than more, more than by a factor two. Um, so we see essentially um, the accuracy or residual is going down exactly like GMS. So we don't even have a, fa a factor two loss here. We see more like 10% loss um, between GMS and sketch GMS. Um, but um, as a reward of sketching and the quick way of generating the basis matrix, uh, we're getting a factor 200-ish um, speed up uh, over GMS. And if we compare it with um, the other uh, restarted version of GMS, um, we're almost as well, basically even faster than most of the, the restarted version. But um, obviously, the restarted versions uh, will lose the optimality in terms of the conversions. So here, um, you know, using SGMS really pays off. Of course, this is one of the best examples that we found. Um, you can also even try to use SGMS for a positive definite matrix. Um, for, for such matrices, it is um, in some sense uh, obviously a better idea to use um, CG. But um, uh, surprisingly, um, first of all, CG isn't much faster than our method. So we're, our method is slower for sure, but um, maybe by like 50%. Um, and you could, you could argue that our method is doing better in, in terms of at least minimizing the residual because obviously we're, we're trying to minimize the residual. Um, CG doesn't, it minimizes um, the A norm of the error. So um, depending on which metric you're looking for, it could be argued that um, SGMS uh, could, could be the way to go, um, even for positive definite matrices, um, even though sketch GMS obviously does not use the fact that it's um, positive semi-definite. Um, I did not want, uh, uh, I do want you to know that it does not always work. So this is one of the um, major open problems. Um, when the, the, the basis matrix VK uh, grows in conditioning, even with our recommended way of um, doing it um, by truncated orthogonalization, um, it, it, it can fail. So um, if you have a difficult problem, the, the condition number BK grows um, exponentially and then too, too quickly before uh, we actually get conversions in the learning system. So uh, it doesn't work all the time yet. Um, so there's plenty of room for um, further development, at least in terms of the practical implementation. Um, another thing I would like to mention maybe briefly for this audience is, uh, is the notion of preconditioning, which is um, usually trying to cluster the eigenvalues or cluster the singular values. Um, maybe this gives us uh, an incentive to, to reconsider preconditioning because um, we don't really need to the preconditioner to do to, to such a great job that we will need only like tens of GMS iterations. We're very happy to do like thousands of GMS iterations as we saw in the experiments. So maybe this, is a, uh, this gives like a new way of looking at um, preconditioning. Um, and maybe a mediocre preconditioning will be good enough uh, in light of um, sketch GMS. Right, okay, so I, I wanted to spend, I don't know how much time I have, um, uh, maybe three or four minutes um, on the, the second problem, which is eigenvalue problems. Um, the idea is very similar, so I am able to go quick, uh, quite quickly. Um, so if you have a square um, eigenvalue problem, which is larger than say like 10,000 or 10, by 10,000, um, you cannot use it, uh, you cannot solve it using um, Q or algorithm even with the, the guaranteed shifts that we um, heard about um, yesterday, or even more essential with any standard um, implementation, it will be quite slow. So um, people, what we do is um, we use a subspace method. So um, essentially we'll try to find a subspace that could hopefully contains the solutions, um, namely the, the partial eigenvector, some of the eigenvectors that you're looking for, and it will usually do rate of it, uh, which is to say we project the matrix onto the subspace by taking Q transpose uh, AQ and then solve the smaller eigenvalue problem uh, from which you can get extract of the so-called approximate eigenpairs. Um, but this process will essentially always require you to do um, NK squared um, operations, essentially because Q is dense and then just computing Q transpose AQ requires NK squared. 
And this is exactly what we didn't like in a sketch chain rest. Um, so we want to avoid this. Um, and um, there are um, obvious things to try, but don't work. Um, so what we do is we start with um, an alternative but equivalent way of understanding ray roots, which is like a variation of variational um, interpretation. So given a basis B, uh, what it does is uh, it will try to find initially um, the best fit in terms of A, B minus B, M. Um, so the minimization was with respect to M. Um, so you, this is essentially a least squares problem, right? Um, a, a set of K least squares problem, which we can sketch. Um, and Ray Ritz turns out to be equivalent to solving um, this um, small eigenvalue problem with respect to this M matrix. Um, what we do in this sketched version of Ray Ritz is to just sketch this problem initially, solve that problem. So that will give us a different solution M hat, um, but this M hat is going to be still a good M hat in, in the sense of minimizing the residual up to con a factor two, just for, for the exact same reason we we've been talking about. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, so sketch this problem and solve for M hat. Um, there are other equivalent um, ways of understanding this. I guess we, I will skip these um, in the interest of time. Um, and uh, for eigenvalue problems, um, there's no compelling reason to have to stick with a Kirill subspace um, as being the, the basis. Um, you can use, for example, Jacoby Davidson. Uh, you can use law PCG or whatever. Um, but the point is, once you have a basis to or subspace to work in, um, you can use this sketch Ray Ritz to, to speed up the computation. Um, so just to finish up with um, some computational results, uh, we're getting uh, like factor 20 speed up, not as remarkable as a sketch GMS, but still uh, with decent speed up and um, good convergence to almost machine precision uh, for a non-symmetric non eigenvalue problem arising in optimization. Um, I'm happy to talk more about uh, where the problem arises if anybody's interested. Um, even for symmetric problems, it turns out that the MATLAB implementation of IGS is um, not very efficient in the sense that it actually is trying to be safe rather than fast. So it actually is doing full orthogonalization. So um, we can easily do better in terms of the speed than um, IGS. And we also saw that it's, it doesn't have like ghost, ghost eigenvalues, which was kind of interesting, uh, just, just in case um, some of you um, have seen ghost eigenvalues as a problem. Um, a final experience, I guess, um, um, just to see how um, sketch ray Ritz is able to find uh, the extreme, extreme eigenvalues of a uh, rather uh, big matrix, I think, um, using a Kirillov, a block Kirillov method. So basically it's the same um, observation. Um, we're able to find the solutions um, up to like a constant factor of deviation from uh, the standard ray Ritz, um using sketching. So uh, this is pretty much it. Um, um, I think sketching um, is very useful <laughs> for all sorts of numerical linear algebra problems beyond what I've been talking about. Um, and here we used um, sketching for um, the subspace problems arising naturally in the context of curl of subspace methods for solving a square problem uh, that reduces the problem to essentially a rectangular problem. Then you can sketch. Um, there are many open problems that um, arise from this work. Um, I like to think this is um, one of the work that tells us that maybe we can move away from what, what is traditionally called orthogonal orthogonal linear algebra. So orthogonal matrices are great, um, but sometimes there's a compelling reason to move away from orthogonal linear algebra because that can lead you to a much um, faster algorithms, uh, especially together with randomization. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop here.